Welcome to the Conversations with Diotima. Today there are with me uh, Professor Ivana Shukula Karasman and Professor Luca Bosic, both from the University of Zagreb, which is from the Institute of Philosophical Research from the Ministry of Science and Education. It's a great welcome. It's wonderful that you visit us here in Paderborn. Today we take the opportunity to get to know more about you and your work. Let's start with telling us what has what is your own education and what are you working now in the field of history of women philosophers, Professor Karasma? I'm working, uh, I have a PhD from Renaissance philosophy, that is something that I do all the time because it's my passion. But uh, now I'm working on Croatian women philosophers, especially Erza Kuchara. She's not known Croatian philosopher and we both, Luca and me, we will try to uh, write a book about her philosophy, but also psychology because she's also uh, a psychologist. So now we are already into the issue. So you are visiting Parabon University. We are organizing now well together because you are supporting these activities here at Parabon University since uh, quite a long time. We are cooperating. So uh, Kuchera is a Croatian philosopher and you are dedicating now your research on yes. creation philosophy. Let yes. us know a bit more about uh, Kuchera. Well, Kuchera uh, is a creation uh, philosopher, but also psychologist, a uh, wound scholar, uh, and also the first woman um, a librarian in this part of Europe, in Austro-Hungarian monarchy, because she lived in end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Uh, she write her uh, dissertation about uh, uh, Thomas Brown, uh, epistem epistemology by uh, Thomas Brown, and uh, she um, tried to work, uh, she was interested especially in logic, because logic was uh, and uh, she thought, uh, same as Wundt, that logic is, uh, is part of uh, psychology. So she spends lots of time uh, working logic, but she never published uh, work uh, about philosophy, but she published a lot about um, uh, psychology. But uh, it is also important to say that she was a feminist and she, uh, uh, she, uh, she wanted to uh, she write about women, women as a librarian, and uh, she tried to put the women in the focus of society. Did she study in Germany with Wundt or...? No, she studied in the University of Zürich. She graduated from the University of Zürich, but later on uh, she also studied a little bit at the U University of Zagreb, where she met a uh, Croatian philosopher uh, Albert Vazala, who was Wundt's uh, pupil. Uh, so uh, she gets some... Uh, so, but her professor uh, at the University of Zürich, Gustav Störing, was her professor uh, of Wundt's. Uh, were once a professor pupil. This is wonderful because we have so many languages mixed here and uh, partly it would be nice to speak in uh, uh, Croatian also. Yeah, we cool. could make it, yes. yes. Professor uh, Borsic, you are a professor and uh, vice director of the Zagreb uh, University or oh, Institute. Of philosophy, of this. Yes, yes, yes. So explain a bit uh, what is this kind of institute there in Zagreb and what kind of studies did you bring there? Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, uh, Institute, of Zag uh, institute of Philosophy exists for already, what, 60 years, 50, 60 years in, uh, in, uh, in Zagreb. We just celebrated our 60 uh, years in, uh, an anniversary and it is... Uh, wonderful institution. It's a research-only institution. So we are doing research in philosophy in, and we are especially dedicated to our, uh, our raison d'etre can be explained by um, trying to dig out, trying to re do research, trying to discover 
uh, especially Croatian uh, philosophical heritage, because as a small nation, as Croatians are a small, uh, we are a small nation, we didn't have so many people who would be researching our past thinkers and so, so we are, our main purpose is just going into the history, trying to publish primary works, trying to comment on them, trying to, um, not trying, but really doing the research, publications and so, Primarily about uh, Croatian uh, philosophical heritage. So, and from where does your training come from? Uh, I'm primarily trained, uh, I have my first PhD was in, it was in ancient philosophy, but more in classics, because I first was a classicist, so I said ancient languages. And so I started going from classics. When I was a student, just maybe a little anecdote, when I was a student, I really hated philosophy. I thought it was just simply a whole bunch of nonsense and words and words and words, and I was more uh, to, uh, inclined toward exact things. And then I happened to meet a wonderful professor of ancient philosophy who introduced me into reading Plato. And when I, when I started reading Plato, I thought it's such a wonderful text. It's so beautifully written. I read it in ancient Greek. It was so, so beautiful, everything. And then I kind of fell in love into, uh, with philosophy by reading Plato, whose style was so magnificent. I fully I, understand. I would subscribe that because it is, yes, it is. And then this was like my introduction. But then, since I, I actually came from uh, ancient languages, this is when I did my second PhD in, in Renaissance philosophy, I kind of turned toward those texts uh, in philosophy which have not been translated, uh, especially Francesco Patrizzi. Uh, and my main, my first project was uh, trying to uh, analyze the Aristotelian tradition within Renaissance philosophy, especially how it contributed to the emergence of modern science, because modern science is the most important event in human history, I would dare to say, and everything connected with modern science is relevant, especially how it came about. I'm hesitating because uh, I think that modern science developed because Platonism came into uh, Renaissance philosophy, but we don't want to go into no, that. No, I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would completely agree. This is, there is yeah. this famous Coares saying, Alexander yes. Coares, that uh, modern science is a victory of Plato and Democritus against Aristotle. A very elegant saying, and I would definitely say there is some, some to it. Yeah. So we have understood now that the institute you are working in is dedicated to retrace the past of uh, Croatian thinkers. So it fits wonderfully and uh, that you are occupied now to build up this digital archive of the Croatian thinkers and we would like to know much more about that. So if you tell us how it uh, came about or how it is installed. Well, after Luka discovered Dušković, we, we started to work on uh, Helena Dušković and uh, that's the time that we met you and uh, we saw what you're doing uh, here on your uh, center. So I thought, and so, so was Luka, uh, we should do a, a website about Croatian philosophers. There are not much. Uh, at, at the beginning, uh, there were not much uh, Croatian philosophers, but we decided to to include all women uh, philosophers from Croatia that have PhD in philosophy. So uh, it is of course much more uh, and the website is getting uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, we wanted uh, to show that also we in Croatia have some philosophers and not uh, bad b philosophers, but interesting philosophers with interesting topics. And uh, so we started uh, to do this website bilingual Croatian and English, but we also uh, put some texts uh, of this philosopher on the web so everybody can read and know something about them. Okay, and who are, according to you, the most interesting uh, Croatian philosophers? Well, I have to say, uh, first Helena Dulsko, it's of course, uh, Elza Kuchera. Uh, I found interesting uh, Ma um, Maria Gucetic, she is a Renaissance philosopher, first woman that we can call a philosopher in Croatia. So these three I would... What would you say, what is your criteria to, to name these women as having done interesting work? What is leading, what is your leading idea to say 
these are interesting because the extent of the work is uh, larger. No, uh, I think about the topics. Uh, I, I found uh, uh, Druskovic interesting because of her work, Pessimistische Cardinals, the Pessimistic Cardinals uh, Proposition. propositions, and um, her work about free will. This is something that was interesting to me because I, uh, I dealt with the topic of uh, free will. And also, uh, uh, and Kuchera, I found Kuchera interesting because she is philosopher and uh, psychologist, and she tries to answer philosophical questions with, with experimental uh, psychology. That's very interesting. How is that? Explain it a bit more to, for us to understand what this is. Well, um, that's the question of the free will by Elsa Kuchera. Uh, and she says, uh, let us show I, I want to show that the people have a free will. And so, so she uh, makes some experiments where people has to answer what they do and of the, if they feel free or not. And of course, uh, she doesn't have, at, at the end, she doesn't have uh, a uh, uh, explicit conclusion, yes, there is free will. Well, it could be a free will or not one uh, said this, the other that, but uh, it is interesting that she tried to to, to Tell us more about the experiment. Oh, it's a quite complicated experiment. So she always, uh, because she, she was follow, a follower of Wundt, she always thought that the uh, people who are in this experiment has to be very educated because they're more important than the psychologist who, uh, who is doing the experiment. Uh, so she had very educated um, uh, subjects. subjects, yes. Uh, so uh, um, she gave them uh, uh, three or five questions, and they have to say if uh, uh, they feel that they said it freely, and when yes, why. And so that's a, that's not a very complex experiment she did, but she also did uh, later on in her life experiment about beauty. But uh, that was at the uh, University of Zagreb when the first laboratory, psych psychological laboratory, was open at the University of Zagreb. I think this is very interesting. So, uh, Professor Borsic, uh, how is the digital page built upon, and what are the principles of building? Professor Karasman said what is very flattering to us. It is, but it is very different to what the center's page is. So, uh, what are the criteria and uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so what can be found there? Okay, so uh, let me give a little bit broader picture of all this. So, we are, uh, we, are we were lucky enough to get a grant uh, to study this project, five year project uh, on creation women philosophers in the European context. That's the title of the project. And we have this project which started two years ago, I think it be from, or yeah, one, one year and a half year and a half ago, uh, funded by the Creation Science Foundation. So it's uh, Creation Science Foundation found, uh, giving some money for this project. And uh, as a part of this project, we also have this uh, web page on Creation Women Philosophers. So um, we organized the web page in, uh, in a way that we include women. So the question is which criteria to apply when including a woman? Uh, with old women, so with women from the Renaissance, from the 16th century onwards, first, there are no many, there are very few of them. And uh, 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 whose literary works we even have. So it's not even a question whether they're philosophers or not. The question is how many even they have some any remains of any written text there. And when we find some woman with literary text, what we are looking for is whether there are some sort of uh, arguments, some sort of rational stuff in that, which is not only not only poetry, not only religious um, laboratory, whatever stuff, but some sort of rational explanations of things. If we find them, then we say, okay, they can in some way be called philosophers because there are some rational arguments there which can be explained and so. So we, for older women, we take this criteria and we include uh, them into our database. For more recent, 
women, beginning from the late 19th century when uh, some first women started getting uh, their PhD in philosophy. Interestingly, we, are, we keep on mentioning the name of Helena Druskovic, or as we like to call her, Druskovic. Of course, she was born in Austro-Hungarian Empire. She probably did not even speak Croatian. Her father was of Croatian origin. This is very typically Croatian name, name from the island of Korčula. So we, are, we proudly call her Croatian philosopher. I, I don't know whether she would be happy with this name or not, but that's uh, how we do it because of her origin. And she was, interestingly enough, she was the first woman to get a PhD in philosophy in all German uh, speak, uh, speaking countries. So uh, she was, uh, she got her PhD from the University of Zurich in uh, 1878, if I'm not mistaken. And um, there was one woman who got a PhD three years before that, she, a Polish woman called Stefani Wolitska. But uh, this uh, woman, although she finished her PhD program and, uh, and wrote her thesis, did not, for some reason which is unknown to me, did not come to her, her graduation. And she was sort of awarded in absentia with her. Uh, and Druskovic, or Druskovic was the first one who really regularly, by regular procedure, received a PhD in, in, in philosophy. So it's interesting for all women in German-speaking countries, because this was the first one to get a PhD in philosophy. No, even first PhD. And so, from this late uh, 19th century onwards, we take the criterion of having a PhD in philosophy. And when we come to the 20th, 20th century, 21st century, to be sort of, yeah, this to have a PhD in philosophy and to have eventually published something. How do we organize our web page? Uh, we have creation. Uh, curriculum vita in creation. We have curriculum vita in English. And then we have, we put online, they are primary works as we find them and digitalize them to some degree. And so this is, I mean, the, the thing is that only even I and myself are doing on this. So there are only two people with help of our technical persons at the Institute doing. So it's a lot of work, a lot of technical work and just a few people working on it. So of course it goes very slowly. So what are the means you are undertaking to spread the work and to create an impact of knowing about? Oh, that is good. That's a good question. Well, um, we're also starting to uh, uh, to uh, um, organize uh, lectures about creation of women philosophers. Uh, we got a very good impact uh, about our web page, especially from a feminist organization who um, who are very interesting on, on, on this topic. We try to organize also symposia about Croatian women philosophers, colloquia. We really try to, to, do, to do the best that we can in these circumstances. Uh, important part is also that we, we started connecting with, uh, as even I said, feminist uh, groups or so who are, have a very good network and who are very connected. So we are presenting at their symposia as well and talking and have very good contacts and so. so this is our, our main goal, yeah, mm. our main. So, and what do you think, what can we do now as institutes to spread further? Because I think it's very important that we are mentioning ourselves, this institute, the other institute on our web pages, and so lead throughout the countries. However, we still not have all European countries now in our network. What is the reason for that? Why doesn't it, uh, exist such a thing in Hungary, in Slovakia, or what is the situation there? We try to get into much contact with the Czech uh, yeah. Czech Republic, and they all the time keep on repeating, but we have only like two or three women. We have nothing or much to start there. Because no, they're no, not no. looking. Yeah, they're not looking or they're not so, they, yeah, they're not so interested for some, but it's, it comes to boils down to private reasons. Maybe people are simply, for some, maybe they haven't yet, but simply they are not really going into that so far. Yeah, and these are still power, okay. Good, 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 but we have to work on, on that. Okay, so, uh, but... Uh, maybe, maybe just to connect a little yeah. bit, if I, if I may, to interrupt you. If, uh, uh, you ask about our institu uh, institutions and connections, so I think that this is sort of maybe I'm a little bit too pessimistic or not, I don't know, it's very hard to say, but even during our conference yesterday and today, 
the same topic uh, keeps on pop, uh, popping up, and namely the problem of that it seems that this the whole area of history and philosophy is some sort of a crisis. And uh, I think one of the big things we, our institutions or people who like-minded people who are dealing with each other here, have to come kind of think about and discuss is how to approach this question of history of philosophy, which seems to be not any more so attractive to people, generally speaking. And the question is, how can we make it more attractive? How can we maybe reshape it, rewrite it, reposition it in a way that the history of philosophy, which I think is extremely important field, gets some sort of a new impetus, gets some sort of new momentum, which would eventually start speaking to people now. There's something which they give answers to people, to the questions people like to ask and to pose. Because it seems that the classically written textbooks do not anymore answer the questions that people are asking nowadays. The answers are not satisfactory anymore. Seems to be the case. Maybe it's of course the question of fashion. Maybe the fashion will change in, in 10 years by then. Let's then go back yeah. to some examples. So what is so exciting, which is a Nogarola? You wrote a Nogarola. What is exciting? Why should we read Nogarola? Why should we read Nogarola? Well, uh, she's a very specific, uh, I would say, philosopher. I, I approached to her as a woman philosopher, uh, writing about uh, the difference between man and the woman, and in a very interesting, uh, interesting way, showing that the women are the uh, same as good as the men. Of course, that's the topic that we can find out, uh, also in some other Renaissance phil uh, women philosophers, even in this, uh, even if one Croatian philosopher, Maria Vucetic, she also wrote that, to, no, she wrote that the women are better than, than the men. But let's go back to, to Nogarola. Um, she had also very interesting uh, life and um, um, uh, letter and changing, so that could be also very interesting to read. Uh, and uh, you can learn about uh, education in Renaissance because she was well educated also as her sister uh, by, um, by home, uh, home teacher. Uh, so you can learn also lots about uh, Renaissance tradition, what's also very, uh, very interesting, I would say. His style of writing is so magnificent. Mm -hmm. First, it's, it's, it, is, it is almost, I would say, al pari to Plato. Her, her dialogue is so multi-layered, so ironical, so many twists, so many different layers that it's just simply a masterpiece of literature. It can be written this way. Another interesting point, which may be, it can be made easily, very contemporary sounding, her piece on, 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 on the equal scene of Adam and Eve, the, the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So it's very important because um, Many religious people st are still struggling nowadays with this question. And she gave, what is this now, 600 years, 700 years ago, she gave very interesting and very contemporary answer to the question which is bothering many Christians nowadays as well. I mean, how to deal with the, with the original sin. Uh, this is a very complicated story altogether. And she gave some very, very interesting insights. Of course, it has to be translated into modern language, into modern parlance to make it more digestible, so to say. But, but some answers she gives are very, very contemporary, very interesting how she deals with this sort of combination of sin and responsibility. So, yeah. Oh, this is quite nice. So, and what about Helene Druskovitz? You have already mentioned that, uh, yes, uh, uh, denial of free will is, uh, has been of interest for you. So, let's start with you again. Yes. What is interesting? Uh, why should we read Helene Druskovitz? Oh. She's very interesting. I think we should read it for everything she wrote. Um, she, except philosophy, she also wrote uh, interesting plays um, and dramas. So uh, if somebody is not so much into philosophy, uh, that person can also find something in her literary works. Uh, I, uh, I, I found her idea of radical feminism very interesting. It could be interesting of somebody who uh, is into um, feminism. And of course, 
and that is not the, the last, but it should be actually the first, because she is a philosopher. She's educated as uh, as philosopher, and she has been a gene philosopher, and she, uh, even in her dramas, there is always a little bit philosophy. So she's really a woman philosopher. And how do you judge her struggle with Nietzsche? Oh, uh, well, uh, I'm a little bit uh, sad when I uh, heard that, uh, that uh, Druskovic is always connected with Nietzsche. I would prefer that the people know about her as a philosopher. That's my aim. That is uh, what I think that, that is necessary. Uh, he got a great impact on her philosophy. Great, great. Uh, it is actually one relationship between love and hate. First love, friendship and then later lots of hatreds from the Druskovic side. But also from Nietzsche's side, yes, mm -hmm. there, is, there is this, this famous uh, letter, famous for us. <laughs> Druskovic <laughs> is called, <laughs> called famous, where Nietzsche puts in a footnote or a PS, uh, postscriptum puts that, that this literary goose, this literature guns, is not everything but my, my, my student. And so she can kind of, yeah, and this is... Yeah. So what is your opinion on Druskovic? And perhaps also, uh, perhaps I ask this question uh, in regard to Nietzsche, because I'm not a Nietzsche follower, okay. so I think her critique is very good. And this is why I'm strengthened at this point. But, uh, yeah, but I would like to, what, do, what is important? in Druskovic? I mean, the question is, uh, as Ivana rightly said, it's uh, Druskovic is important for, depending on which, from which perspective you take it. If you take it from a purely uh, from the point of view of the history of philosophy, then she is important as a very interesting uh, Critic, friend, and enemy of Nietzsche, and uh, and someone who really understood deeply, I guess, his philosophy, and who uh, and who attacked Nietzsche's philosophy at some weak points. Uh, her analysis is not always thorough; it's not always detailed because it was a style of writing is uh, such that. But some she has very some very strong points criticizing Nietzsche that he is just a sub he is creating substitute for religion, replacing one religion with another religion. He is also, she's also criticizing Nietzsche of being. Interestingly, not radical enough for for, uh, for for her. Nietzsche was sort of too meek, too weak. Uh, he, he should have gone much further than he went. Uh, so, so this is very interesting from uh, merely historical point of view. Another interesting mo moment about uh, Druskovic is she published this booklet, her last booklet called Pessimistic Cardinals. It's a pessimistic cardinal proposition as we translated it into English. By the way, I think it's worth mentioning that we have um, this book exists in German, of course. In a, there is also a modern edition, I think in, in 1988 published, republished. But there is also one very unknown, I think, a partial Italian translation and also uh, relatively um, not so much discussed and known Swedish translation. But we have published now Croatian translation and now our English translation is also done. So we are done with English translation and hopefully within a few months or whatever it will be published and so in, and, and, uh, with, uh, it will be the first English translation of her work. So this booklet, which is about 50 pages or something, mm -hmm. that's uh, not, not a big booklet, contains in a note some uh, ideas which can be claimed to be anticipating some 20, 20th and 21st century important movements within feminist philosophy. First, she defended something which, or she proposed something which we can call radical feminism. Of course, she did not use this word, and this term came into existence in the 60s of the 20th century, but some of her, some of her mo points, uh, some of her ideas, can be rightfully labeled so when she claims the absolute superiority of women over men and so they, or when she claims that men are responsible for more or less all the evil of the world, whatever. Uh, this comes back to, or can be compared to some radical feminist teachings of the 20th, 20th century. Also interesting, she has something, some moments in her book which we also trace back to some kind of eco-feminist movements. She claims, for instance, that men are destroying the earth and planet because they are so voracious. They, they devour everything, they kill everything, and by this destroying the nature, destroying the, the planet earth. And she just explicitly says the earth is being destroyed by men as it is. Women who are much more in touch with nature will save the planet if, if, they, if, it, if it were left to women. 
interesting, I mean, as I said again, this is, she just threw away such ideas. She did not really develop them in detail. But interesting enough that such ideas we can find only 50, 60 years afterwards in, in some movements. And I think this is fascinating to see some thinker who, who was almost, who had some almost, almost, we could say, prophetic vision in, in some movement that came into existence 50, 60, 70 years after her death. She died in 1916, 1918s, yeah. I think indeed this sounds very exciting. And so my next question would be, why do you think uh, what I hold sometimes is that the fame, the idolization, you know, when you think the idolization of Nietzsche is incredible and was politically horribly, yeah. but it did not prevent people from reading and uh, using this philosophy. And it is such an impressive figure, the Druskovitz. So what could one do or should one also try to idolize women as men have been idolized through these historical and institutional traditions? I think no. I think it is wrong to uh, idolize uh, main philosophers, but uh, it is also wrong to <laughs> to do the same with uh, women philosophers. I think that is enough that we research them, write about them, translate them, and give them all the rights and beauty that they deserve. Oh, well, I'm sorry. What do you think? <laughs> I hope you say something differently. <laughs> so, because it's a, 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 so, it is a problem how to bring somebody forward. We are living in the times of media of sight and sound, yes, it's but really difficult. I think it would be wrong to do the, the way that Nietzsche was uh, put on the pedestal, so. No, I mean, it, it's, this is, uh, it has also come into discussion in the, as a matter of discussion in our seminars today and yesterday. Uh, the thing is that it's hard, uh, your question points to some sort of comparison. It's hard to compare a philosopher who has, uh, whose complete opposites like two meters of books, and who has such a wonderful style of writing. I mean, no one can deny that Nietzsche is an excellent writer in German language, I guess. I mean, this is just simply magnificent, his style. And even Druskovitz acknowledges, when even she hated Nietzsche the most, she said he is just a brilliant writer. And with such a talent, he should be a better philosopher. <laughs> I mean, that's what she basically says. So uh, I think, uh, so it's hard to compare, it's unfair to compare someone like this, with such an opus, to someone who published like three or four short tiny books in philosophy, and not in such any systematic way whatsoever. So this is unfair comparison. So I think there is, um, uh, what is what gives some sort of enthusiasm and what makes one really excited about such things is discovery of something really interesting, new, and unexpected. One suddenly finds something uh, neglected, something which is un unrightfully neglected. For instance, take Druskovitz. Druskovitz, she had a lot of psychological problems. She ended up she, uh, in an in a asylum. She spent almost what, 20, more than 20 years in, in, in asylum. She was always labeled as a crazy woman. Even interestingly, we had a, maybe a little anecdote from our institute. When we first presented um, a text on Druskovitz and her work, and then one philosopher, interestingly, woman philosopher from the audience say, oh, but you should not talk like that to her. It's unfair. This poor woman was crazy. You cannot really abuse her for your philosophical purposes and showing this, because this is all, uh, such, she had such radical ideas that uh, this, our colleague who was uh, in the audience thought that this would be almost ridiculing the, the poor woman, as she called poor woman, who is just mentally sick. This sort of... Uh, if I may know, just yeah. a second, but uh, she didn't think the, the same about Nietzsche, because Nietzsche also spent his 20 or more years at, at the hospital, but... This accusation of calling uh, uh, Druskovic cra crazy woman and Nietzsche not, even came back to Nietzsche's times, uh, one of the, their correspondents said, oh, but it's poor Druskovic, she's just in asylum. She did not say the same about Nietzsche. And to see this injustice about uh, the author gives some, at least me, some fuel, some more enthusiasm to struggle with this and to actually, it's almost like fighting for truth. Let, let's give some sort of right, let's give some, uh, let's fix some sort of, yeah, some sort of injustice done in the history of philosophy because of some prejudices, because of some ideas which are now completely obsolete. I mean, which no one really holds and which were, which are wrong and obsolete ideas, uh, prejudices, yes. 
So this is the idea on why doing the history of women philosophy, yeah, the, the moral enthusiasm yes, yes, to yes. to care for justice. Yeah, to care for justice, for justice plus plus, it's whole bunch of extremely interesting and new ideas. We should not neglect, philosophically speaking, interesting, unexpected new ideas. And that's, I think, every philosopher should be excited about discovering something new and some new unexpected idea. This is, this is what we are about. We are about new, interesting ideas. Mm -hmm. And we don't care where they come from, I mean, especially if they come from unjustly neglected women, even better so. You gave a talk on women in capitalism and the impossibility uh, of, the, of an equality, of a realizing the equal rights for women because capitalism is built on a structure of exploitation which ends and always ends in the women's, uh, uh, on the women's side, yes. Yeah. Would you explain this issue a bit more to us? Yeah, okay, so I had some very simple idea which I tried to develop, which I was, uh, and this can be boiled down, this can be described as a very simple syllogism in logic. You can start from one premise, the first premise, minor premise, is uh, uh, or major premise, women are selfless. I don't hear in this claim, of course, it's a very controversial claim and it can be open to many discussions. So I say, I don't, at this level of discussion, this level of provocation, I don't enter into the question whether they are trained to be selfless, they are biologically, because there are some ideas, some that even biologically women for the matter of children and taking care should be, should be more caring pe uh, beings than men and so on. So uh, women are both trained and maybe perhaps yes or perhaps no also essentially selfless or more selfless than men. Second premise, capitalism is based on selfishness. Basic tenets of capitalism is trying to augment richness, trying to whatever, for selfish reasons as much as the law forbids. And if you combine those two premises, you can you come to a very simple conclusion that capitalism is not a good habitat for women. And this, I tried, I, I, in, in my, uh, my, my idea was the following, that this extremely simple syllogism gives one of the explanations, or maybe it's not the, definitely not the only explanation, I don't claim that this covers everything or whatever, but this contributes to this problem that even nowadays in the most advanced societies, like Australia, like the Scandinavia, like Germany and so on, women are still very much underrepresented in, in the capitalistic structures and still advance not as much, not as, as, in, in as much number, not as, as successfully in, this, in the hierarchy of capitalism as men. And the big question is if there are no more, or even there are very few, much lesser obstacles than before, why there is no more equality? I propose that this sort of simple psychological answer could contribute a little bit to answer this question, why is it the case that women are not more present in a high positions in a hierarchy within capitalistic systems. But are you really convinced that women are selfishless? Uh, that women are uh, selfless. I'm a convinced personally from my life experience. So oh, I have encountered many women who are very selfless, some who are selfish. I'm convinced that uh, in our society, women are very often raised and educated to be selfless, that it is claimed as a sort of caring. Of course, the question is, uh, it's very fine uh, difference between to be caring and to be selfless, whether it's the same story or the different so on. But that women, that as a feminine virtue, as a women's virtue to be caring is promoted very much nowadays still, I think it is the case, yes. Okay. Uh, don't you think this is a kind of dialectics behind it, that uh, it is the most successful way of marketize oneself in the sense of a capitalism to sell oneself under the branding of being selfless? Yeah, this would be interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm not expert in marketing, I'm not uh, expert in capitalism, yeah, but it sounds, it sounds, yeah, it sounds convincing that 
to turn the twist uh, things uh, upside down and to sell yourself as a selfless uh, would be successful uh, capitalistic uh, move I guess it, it would, seems yeah. so yeah, that it, it is so. you know when we look into the tradition as we have heard now in philosophy and culture that it was the institutional demand of women of course to be selfless moderated and so on so they have to give the positor to be so Otherwise, there is nothing. And there have been always been women who try to get into the businesses and so on. They have been less successful than the women who went on this horse, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> selling yeah. them, marketizing them as the selfless one. I mean, there, there is now, without being an expert on, on the economy and capitalism, in my research, I, I noted that recently, relatively, relatively recent, last 10 years or 15 years, there is this uh, ever-growing movement of trying to promote some types of different uh, capitalism, self-capitalism, which of course is very much connected with uh, our ecolog ecological problems and so, because this selfish exploitation of Earth is, seems to be disastrous. So. Some different type of capitalism seems to be very appropriate to, and this type of less selfish or more caring type of capitalism seems to be you know, taking ever more and more interest in people. Especially, I mean, it, it can be slightly connected also to, to the question of uh, mathematics and economy in some way, because it seems that uh, um, there are ever more growing voices that mathematical explanations of economy is not satisfactory because we had this huge crisis in economy in 2008-2009 and mathematical predictions were not successful in neither predicting this crisis nor giving solution and now some economists for instance within the so-called movement of social ontology are trying to find different approaches to economy more social maybe some, some of them would be also more feminist, whatever, to try to see, okay, if mathematics is not successful tool, tool in explaining economy, in predicting economic events, maybe there are other tools, maybe we should look at the things. But have you ever believed that mathematics is an appropriate tool for economics? We were raised like that. This, is, uh, this was our training. We were taught so in schools or whatever, so this was... Uh, I'm wondering, because I think it is a precondition of mathematics and of logic that, let's say, the issues you are calculating with, you have selected before you are sending it into the algorithm of whatever comes out. Yeah. Would you please describe the project you have installed at your institute? Uh, what is the impact and how will you bring it further? How will it develop? What are your plans? Well, we plan to make uh, a big international conference about Croatian women and women philosophers. Uh, we will also publish books about Elza Kuchera and Helena Doskovic. It, we have still three years to to uh, continue our research on uh, Croatian women philosophers. We try to do actually every day something for Croatian women philosophers. So it's, it's a project that, uh, who goes on all the time. Professor Borsic, what do you think? How would you describe the future of the project? Exactly as Ivana said, we are just going. Yes. We, are, <laughs> uh, we have, I mean, we have uh, the requirement for the project was very precise. So we had to lay out very almost up to uh, every month in five, five years in advance what we are going to do. So there is not much here uh, changes. I mean, we can change, but so we have uh, 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 several uh, workshops. We also have uh, on different topics within. We also have to publish uh, a few books. We have two international symposia to organize. Can organs. people see this? Is this announced on the web page yeah, yeah. so they yeah. can yeah, yes. go to your web page yes, and yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. inform? Of course, as I said, we are simply lacking people, so it depends on our uh, our work. But yes, we have a web page and this pa mm -hmm. uh, Facebook web page and. We can be, I, I admit, we can be a little bit more quick in updating stuff in there, but yes, we, uh, they, everything can be done. But uh, as you probably also know yourself, very much goes also by wor word of mouth and how people are so... Uh, so what kind of conference will this be next year? We are trying to combine uh, 
both uh, the title of the project is uh, Croatian women philosophers in European context. So we would not only go with Croatian women philosophers, but a uh, more broader context because uh, Croatian women philosophers were intellectually very much connected with either Italy or Germany or Austria or so. So it would be necessary to contextualize. Uh, we are both very much into sort of hermeneutical approach to philosophy where the context matters a lot. The context uh, contributes to our general knowledge quite a lot. So we would uh, go with an international conference in which we would like to get some not only about talk about creation of women philosophers, but also from a more broader perspective, historical or philosophical. So we will be there. Sure. Thank you. We very are much. counting. We are counting with you. <laughs>